Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, thank you that we can gather in your presence. You are here. So we do pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to you. Create room in us, O oh Lord, for what you want to do both in us and through us. And so we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. We yield to your authority. And we thank you that we are your servants. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I want you to know that we're talking about what some might call a wild woman today, in Teresa of Avila. I personally only give that title to two women I know in church history, one of whom, of course, is Teresa, and the other is Hildegard of Bingen. Teresa, this incredibly interesting combination of deep, profound, mystical solitude and unbelievable activism. In an era where people didn't travel so much, Teresa literally on foot went all over Spain, founding God knows how many different convents, spiritual director for an extraordinary group of people, both male and female. She was someone who literally rose to the occasion in a time in Spain where that kind of consecrated, and sacrificial leadership was in short supply. You, if you have any sort of memory about what happened in the medieval time, among other things know that it wasn't one of the best times for the church. It was a corrupt period. And yet Teresa stood up and made a difference. And God used her in such extraordinary ways that through, particularly because of her writing, she was given by the church, the title Doctor of the Church. An extraordinary title for a church at the time that didn't even believe in female priests because of the clarity of what she wrote. And so what I want to do this morning is actually punctuate uh, my sermon with quotes actually from her writing. Uh, I would highly commend Interior Castle, which is her most famous book, but I have to say to you that you need to read it quietly. This is not something you can read with the television on. Um, because she writes, it's thick. With meaning, illusion, and sidebar hints, um, and, and it's an extraordinary level of frankness. At one time, she went through her a terrible time of illness from which she eventually died. And she was so despondent about it all in her sort of casual frankness, one of her most famous comments was, well, Lord, if this is how you treat your friends, it's no wonder that you don't have very many of them. <laughs> I mean, she had that kind of sort of bright trust is the way I would describe it. She knew that she belonged to God, that God would never let her go, and she was secure in that relationship, which is in fact what gave her the capacity to live with such bravery, courage, the capacity to, in essence, what we would say, speak truth to power in a way that many of her leaders in other parts of the church would have gone, oh, there she goes again. And they would want to hide in a corner someplace. But, you know, in a way that was pretty extraordinary, she got away with it. But she got away with it in part because it really did come out of both extraordinary intellectual clarity. She was an incredibly intelligent woman. But also out of profound compassion. She never spoke up for spite. There wasn't anything inside of her that used words to get even. Instead, it always came out of both clarity and compassion. And I think both of those are incredibly important for any kind of public leadership. That you need to be smart, you need to be clear, you need to see what's really going on and, 
in essence, call it for what it is. But if you're doing that in a way to draw attention to yourself, or you're doing it as a way to kind of poke at the people who are in power in a way that doesn't come out of a heart of love, you just come across as either a sort of funny cynic. You know, many people know how to use negative humor. Or, and therefore not taken particularly ser seriously, except as a satirist, perhaps. But you're never heard in a way that says, hmm, she has a point. So what I want to do is talk a little bit, sort of step back for a minute, because I, I have to tell you, my sisters in Christ, I am longing for Teresa's in our day, right here even in the Diocese of Central Florida. And so you who have already, in essence, said yes by virtue of your membership as an Episcopal Church woman, you have said yes to leadership. You have said yes to being one of those people who is willing in the venue where God has placed you, specifically your parish, your community, where you live, and secondarily within the diocese, and perhaps even beyond, You've already said yes to God to say, okay, I'm yours. Do with me as you will. So what does that look like? So here's where we start. We start with the gospel. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything. You are the light of the world, the city built on a hill cannot be hid. Now, if you hear those with any level of realism, a part of what makes you think of it as me, light of the world, uh, I don't think so. What Jesus is speaking to in using those extraordinary analogies is that he is speaking to what God has put within you. What God has put within you. It's not an analysis of your talent or your background or your education, although God can use and does all of those. God has the wonderful capacity to, in essence, redeem anything. I mean, remember, if you read the little pricey in the book, in your bulletin about Teresa, it hints at the fact that she was what we would now call a very rebellious teenager. But the fact of the matter is, is that God, if we have said yes to Jesus Christ, God has put something powerful in us. And it is, in fact, his own nature. As Paul writes in Romans, the very same spirit which raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. In other words, God has put something extraordinarily big and powerful in what is, in fact, true for most of us, pretty inconsequential vessels. I mean, most of us are right when we feel like God's tapping us on the shoulder and you say, you got to be mistaken. Who, me? But what God is doing is that he is not, you see, looking at you as just an ordinary human being. He's looking at you as an ordinary human being in whom God has placed his own nature. Or, to use Jesus' analogies, it is within you that he has placed salt, light, which is, in fact, the capacity to make a difference. The capacity to allow the God to move through you in such a way as that people see something that is, in fact, supernatural. Notice the last line. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory, notice the word, to your Father in heaven. Who is the Father? In Jesus' story, the Father is the one who cares, filled with compassion and loving kindness, who moves into action when he sees the needs of others. That's, that's the father analogy in the New Testament for God. It is relational. It is powerfully filled with love. It is the God who, in love and compassion, acts on behalf of his people. And therefore, when he says that, what he's, he's describing is the kind of things to which we are called. 
to let our light so shine before others that they may see your good works, see what you're doing, and say, there must be a God who cares for me to encounter a woman like this. Again, see, it's not mean and nasty. You're not just stirring up a ruckus for the sake of getting into trouble. It's not about calling attention to yourself. It has everything to do in acting in such a way as a servant that what comes through is both, boy, nobody could do that on her own. That's got to be something powerful working within her. That's God. But the character of the action itself reflects that very compassion and that very light. That's, that's the invitation. Do you, in fact, believe that you are capable of acting in that way? Let me say that again. Do you believe that you are, in fact, capable of acting in that way? Well, your only answer, if you believe even the third of what I've just said, is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the answer. The answer is not no, I'm not capable. But nor is the answer a kind of cheerleading, yeah, yeah, let's go do this. Because if you're not in a way that is if deeply dependent upon him who has placed this power within you, oh, all of your grandstanding will literally fall apart. No, it's God actually working through you in a way that actually makes a difference in the lives of other people. So it starts with what it is that God has put in you. Again, let me quote Teresa. Whenever we think of Christ, we should recall the love that led him to bestow on us so many graces and favors. And the great love that God has shown in giving us in Christ that pledge of his love. To sort of put it plainly, do you actually in your heart of hearts believe that God loves you? For plenty of people, they actually the answer is no. Particularly if they've not done well this past day. They can think of lots of reasons inside as to why they would not be the best candidate for the love of God. But you see, that's not it. He loves us because of what he has placed within us. And the potential that he sees within us to walk with a level of dignity and clarity and courage that marks us as his. That's what he sees within us, you see. And he loves us because he knows what we can become. Because he sees everything that is inside of us and says, I know, and yet, and yet, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. See, a world needs that kind of witness. Paul writes with unbelievable frankness in his epistle to the Romans. We know. It's like, don't we? He's saying a kind of obvious fact. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor until now. In other words, he's a profound realist about the kind of pain and agony that is in fact the mark of our life. He gets that. Paul is never shying away from, in essence, the worst that life has to offer, and as someone who was actively persecuted, with the, including death threats, failed executions. Remember, he was stoned and left for dead. So it's not as if somehow he's writing those words from somebody who's never had to deal with the worst of life. Just the opposite. And he says, we know, don't we, what creation, what real life is like. And it is because of that he talks about what God has placed within us. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Again, salt, light, power. The two lessons literally come together just like this. And therefore, we can count on in the midst of that, even in the worst that life has to offer, the very companionship and faithfulness of God. Again, Teresa, if Christ Jesus dwells in someone as his friend and noble leader, that man can endure all things, for Christ helps and strengthens us and never abandons us. Abandons us. He is our true 
friend, our true friend. And it is that that gave her both her power in prayer, which was formal, and her capacity to lead in the midst of a generation and a culture in Spain that had little time for women. So, sisters, are you secure in the love of God? Teresa says, anyone who truly loves God travels securely. Are you willing to step out? What is your answer? If your answer is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me then God will do what he wants to do through you in a way that in fact could have a very powerful impact on your church and on your community. And let me tell you, my sisters, if I hear rumors like that, I will cheer you on. We need Teresa's. Women of prayer, women who are secure in the love of God, and women of action. May it be so, O oh Lord. Amen.